and then there will be a short, short poll at the end. Please help us do this. It helps with reporting purposes um, during this virtual time. All right, so the Zuma Scientist series, many of you have heard this spiel before, but it's the last one of the, the season. So welcome to Zuma Scientist. The series is sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, UVM Extension and SUNY Plattsburgh Education Program known as Watershed Alliance. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. Watershed Alliance aims to reach K through 12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The Zuma Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. So my name's Caroline Blake. I'm gonna be one of the moderators today and Nate Trochte also working with Sea Grant is behind the scenes as well, who will be monitoring the, the chat box and questions along the way. Um, but let's welcome today's presenter. Allison Adams is our watershed forestry coordinator. She joined Lake Champlain Sea Grant and UVM Extension in March 2020. As the watershed forestry coordinator, she manages the watershed forestry partnership, coordinating riparian forest buffer restoration efforts across the Lake Champlain Basin. Allison has a master's degree in natural resources from UVM, which focused on mapping forest change in New England. She is currently completing her PhD exploring how environmental change affects people's connection with nature. Prior to graduate school, Allison worked in Washington, DC in environmental advocacy and community outreach. Outside of work, she can usually be found hiking, rock climbing, or foraging for mushrooms, which it might be the season if I'm not correct. Um, it is, morels so, are up right now. So I have, not <laughs> I have a lot seen of quite a few photos. I haven't <laughs> found any myself, but um, I've been looking for other other forestry goods. All right, so um, Nate, can you go to the next slide, please? All right, so in today's webinar, um, we will be discussing riparian forests and why they matter. Allison will explain the many benefits of streamside forests for Vermont and the status of those forests in the state of Vermont in this 30 minute presentation followed by 10 to 15 minutes worth of questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna mute myself and go behind the scenes and pass over the floor to Allison. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. Um, okay, is everybody seeing my screen all right? Looks good to us. Perfect. So um, thanks so much, Caroline. I really appreciate the introduction. So today I'm going to be um, talking about the importance of riparian forests, as Caroline said, and the state of riparian forests in Vermont. So let's start with some basic definitions. What do I mean when I say riparian forest? So this is a simplified diagram showing a riparian area. And a riparian area is just the space next to a stream or a river or a wetland. It can be any type of terrestrial environment. It could be a field, it can be a forest, it could be even developed or paved, but not all of these riparian areas have equal benefits to people and the rest of nature. But when riparian areas are healthy forests, they can provide a number of important benefits and services for the ecosystem, for wildlife, and for humans. And I'll talk about these benefits in detail in a minute. But before I do that, um, what might a healthy riparian forest look like sort of in the wild? Um, it might look like this, um, really the forest part, obviously not the river, um, or this, this is a, sort of a bird's eye view or it might look like this. And all of these are images of riparian forests from Vermont. So when they are like that, there are a lot of benefits for the ecosystem and for the human communities living nearby and downstream on the waterway. And so I'm gonna spend some time talking about what all of those benefits are. And there are a lot. Um, so riparian forests, can improve water quality by filtering sediment and nutrients from runoff. They can control erosion. They can decrease the frequency and severity of major flood events. They can provide wildlife habitat. They can provide spaces for recreation and spaces of cultural significance. Um, riparian forests can help mitigate climate change. And um, Finally, at least in terms of my list, though I maybe even be missing some benefits, uh, riparian forests can help support healthy stream conditions for aquatic organisms. I'm gonna talk about each of these in more detail. So first of all, water quality. If you've 
heard about the benefits of riparian forests, this is probably the one you've heard the most about, especially because we have a serious water quality issue in Lake Champlain. And it's absolutely true. Um, vegetated riparian areas can reduce erosion and retain nutrients, which limits what can enter local waterways with really positive effects for um, downstream water quality. And you might be asking why forests? Um, well, grass and shrub buffers can provide some of these benefits. So it's um, vegetation in general is a really great thing to have on the bank of a waterway. Um, and also the benefits of any given riparian, vegetated riparian area depend a lot on the details of that particular site. You know, the slope, what's planted there, what kind of runoff they get, so, um, even just particular storm events. But still there's evidence that forested buffers are the most effective type of um, forest of uh, riparian buffer, which just means like the, uh, a vegetated area along a waterway um, that for trapping sediment. And sediment is a really significant source of phosphorus in Lake Champlain in particular. So there's a lot of focus on forested buffers in Vermont. Um, and it's actually one of the many strategies being applied across the Lake Champlain Basin to meet the target reductions for phosphorus in the lake. Um, and you may know that phosphorus is a nutrient that causes eutrophication. It causes those harmful algal blooms that um, you hear about during the summer um, when it's present in waterways in excessive quantities. Another benefit of riparian buffers and especially forested buffers is that they absorb water and release that water more slowly than non-vegetated riparian areas. So if you have a major storm event and a lot of water running across the landscape, riparian buffers can help sort of absorb and slow that down. Um, which means that, that that water is released into waterways more slowly, and then you have less giant sort of flood events as a result. Um, research, recent research shows that the greatest flood mitigation benefits are achieved when riparian buffers are restored around all river, river tributaries, even including those little ephemeral streams that you just see in the spring. So that's a really big project to do all of that but still some of the benefits can be provided even with fewer areas restored. So it's still worth it to restore riparian forests, even if you can't get to every little bit of the waterways that feed one particular river. And then an additional benefit is you get that um, is by stabilizing stream banks, by planting um, trees and other you know, plants that have strong root systems, um, riparian forests can help mitigate flood related erosion. Okay, so another benefit of riparian forests is that they can support um, wildlife populations. So a network of intact riparian forests can connect larger blocks of habitat for migrating and wide ranging species, including big game species and birds such as the golden winged warbler and American woodcock. Um, and in many places they are already serving a habitat connectivity role. Um, to ensure that they provide the highest quality habitat, riparian buffers need to be designed to um, develop diverse forest structure, which means that they would have maybe a range of tree ages, dead standing trees, and downed wood, um, and also that they be composed of native plant species whenever possible. And I really want to stress that point because I'll come back to it when I'm talking about challenges for riparian forest restoration in Vermont. The native tree species Bit is really important um, so that we're not spreading invasive species and because those are the trees that our ecosystems have evolved to have, um, but it, it is presenting a challenge for restoration and we'll talk more about that later. So here's a map of part of Vermont. This is in Addison County showing areas that were identified by Vermont Fish and Wildlife as being high priority blocks of forest um, for connectivity. Those are in yellow and how the riparian corridors, which are shown in brown, can help connect those critical blocks. So you can see that there are these big areas of habitat um, and ideally for wide ranging species, you want animals to be able to travel between those blocks and riparian forests, because they're right along those waterways which flow all over the landscape can really help serve that function for a lot of species. Riparian forests can also be extraordinarily biodiverse ecosystems. In fact, research shows that riparian zones as compared to upland forests can be home to substantially higher numbers of species of plants, beetles, birds, other animals. Um, and one example is the wood turtle, which is a species of conservation concern in the Northeast. And wood turtles regularly emerge from streams to forage for food in nearby forests and meadows. And so for that particular species, it's really important to have healthy riparian forests. And then on top of that, riparian forests can also benefit the aquatic ecosystems that they border. So it's not just the um, terrestrial ecosystems that are benefiting, but that those actually, those benefits spill over into the aquatic ecosystems. So mature riparian forests shade streams, which keeps water cool moderates and moderates fluctuations in stream temperature. Um, 
light intensity in a shaded portion of the stream can be 30 to 60% less than that in exposed portion. So that can translate into a pretty dramatic difference in stream temperature. Um, and when you have high stream temperatures, that can affect the respiration of aquatic organisms, increase the susceptibility of fish to diseases, um, and can even inhibit fish reproduction. Um, and then furthermore, riparian forests are an important source of in-stream woody debris that creates important, important stream habitat structure um, and also provides organic matter that can serve as food for stream organisms. So just a ton of benefits for wildlife in stream and out of the stream from riparian forests. So the benefits just keep coming. So um, like other forest ecosystems, forested riparian buffers can also sequester and store carbon, which can mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, there was a recent review of research on carbon storage in riparian forests specifically, and it found that um, establishing a riparian forest can triple the soil carbon stocks, the amount of carbon that's stored in the soil there. And mature riparian forests can store an average of about 70 to 160, uh, 160 megagrams of carbon per hectare, which is quite a fair amount. Um, so there's a huge benefit for um, climate change mitigation from restoring riparian forests. Um, and on top of that, that actively restoring riparian forests can kind of jumpstart carbon sequestration because planted trees grow more quickly initially than plants that than trees that are just growing from seed stock in the forest. So um, we can actually get a bigger, faster benefit from restoring riparian forests than from letting them just regenerate naturally, which is difficult in many sorts of situations now anyway. Um, and then there are, of course, other components of the buffer that can also affect start carbon storage and sequestration. For example, there's been some recent research that shows that having a robust understory, so a layer of trees underneath the main canopy, can also increase carbon storage and wildlife benefits. Okay, so finally, riparian forests can also provide important sites for recreation and sites of cultural significance. And one really great example of this is the name Winooski, as at the Winooski River. Um, some of you probably know this, but the original version of this word translates roughly to land of the wild onion. And the river was named this by the Abenaki people after the abundance of wild leeks or ramps growing on its banks. And it's the season for ramps right now. So if you are into foraging at all, you might have heard that although ramps can still be found in a lot of places along the river, they are becoming scarce in some areas, in many cases due to development. And so keeping these river and streamside areas as forests is a really important part of maintaining this aspect of indigenous heritage and the history of this area. Um, and then also because of the historical concentration of human settlements along streams and, and rivers um, used for transportation, riparian areas are often hotspots of cultural importance and of archeological artifacts. So we have to be really aware of what we're doing with those spaces and often keeping them natural is a better way to protect those resources. And finally, as I'm sure a lot of you know, riparian forests can provide really great sites for recreation. You know this if you've ever been like trout fishing on a really beautiful river and you get to spend some time in the woods and um, it's nice and shaded so the trout are healthy um, or you know, keeping cool along the riverbanks or in the water on a summer day with friends. I probably don't need to describe these benefits too much to most of you. So if we know that riparian forests are so important, what is the state of these forests in Vermont? Well, we do have a lot of riparian areas in Vermont that are forested, and I showed you some pictures of those earlier, um, but we also have a lot of places where riparian areas are no longer forested and instead land uses like agriculture go right up to a waterway like in this picture here. Or here, where you can see the erosion that those forests maybe could help prevent. Um, so this is also not an uncommon site um, in Vermont, unfortunately. Um, and there's a lot of places where um, the way we've built our agricultural system just means that things are going right up to the waterways and that has um, you know, a lot of impacts on sort of the opposite of what I just described. So negative impacts on water quality, on wildlife, a missed opportunity for climate mitigation, um, loss potentially of cultural heritage and recreation opportunities. So there's a there's a lot that happens when, when this is what we see on the landscape. And I wish I could say that we know exactly how much of our rivers and streams do or don't have rip riparian forests on their banks, but I can't. Um, there have been efforts to map the status of riparian forests in the state, but we don't yet have a statewide consistently updated map for this, at least not as far as I know, but if somebody on this call knows of one, please tell me. Um, 
we do have maps in some smaller geographies in the state, like this one on this slide, which is of the Hungerford, Hungerford Brook watershed in the Mississippi Basin. Um, this was done in 2017, and actually all the Mississippi was mapped at that time. So I haven't done, I don't have um, the analysis of this to say exactly what percentage is um, protected in a riparian forest and what percentage is not. Um, but from looking at some of these images, I would guess it might be maybe a little under half, maybe 40 to 50%, but that's just a stab in the dark. Again, I haven't done the calculations. Um, and in this, on this map, I'm not sure if you guys would be able to read the key, it might be kind of small, but the places that have um, a riparian forest that's at least 25 feet wide are marked in green. And the places that don't have that are marked in red. And one of the difficulties in calculating sort of what the status of riparian forest is in Vermont, other than it being a really time intensive project, especially if you wanna account for small tributaries or ephemeral streams, um, is that there just isn't one number that's the necessary forest width. So as a rule, wider is better. Um, people generally, and people generally agree that at least 50 feet is needed to achieve any water quality improvements. Um, and then some studies suggest that you can get 80 to 90% of all of the benefits with a riparian forest that's 100 feet wide. Um, but for wildlife benefits, some animals need even more space um, and the details of how a restored riparian forest is designed and where it's located um, can really affect the benefits that you get. So um, when you set out to map or try and calculate the status of riparian forests, you kind of have to agree with everybody on that project and what the criteria is for a given bit of forest counting or not counting. And that makes sort of figuring out what the status is kind of challenging. For instance, there may be some buffers here that are smaller than 25 feet. I would say that's probably, they probably shouldn't be counted. Um, there may be some that are vegetated. That's probably better than not vegetated, but definitely better than not vegetated. Um, but should that be counted in some way? So it just gets kind of complicated to really assess the exact status. Um, but we do have isolated bits of data here and there like this map to help do that. So that's one challenge, just sort of accounting for what's going on. And then there are some other challenges for riparian buffers in the state, and I'll mention a few of them. So one is invasive species. Um, you might've heard about the emerald ash borer, which has now been found in Vermont. Um, there was a study in Michigan where there's more emerald ash borer sort of exploring the effects of this particular invasive insect on riparian forest composition and structure. And it found that um, ash regeneration is decreasing and more than 85% of mature ash had died in sites across Southern Michigan due to that particular invasive insect. Um, and ash is an important part of our riparian forest. So we're likely to see some change in our forest composition species um, in terms of tree species, and that could have an impact potentially on other benefits. And we're not entirely sure what those might be yet. Um, invasive plants are also an issue. Reed canary grass in particular dominates a lot of riparian areas right now, and it's really hard to control, um, but it gets super, super tall. So you need to control it in order for seedlings, seedling trees to grow successfully. Um, some people do use herbicide. You can do various mechanical methods. We, I know we have a graduate student on the call who's working on this particular issue, um, but this is a big challenge. It's something that practitioners across the state are talking a lot about to try and figure out how to manage it. Um, deer browse, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but it's also a significant challenge. Um, deer like to eat the little baby trees that we plant. Um, so it takes a lot of work to, to protect the trees from that. And then I mentioned this before, um, there's also a statewide and in fact nationwide shortage of native trees for restoration projects. Um, and I could talk about this for a long time um, and I will try not to, um, but the, the long and short of it is it just limits how many riparian areas we can restore and how quickly. Um, so this is something that really needs to be addressed if we wanna take on a really, um, really large riparian forest restoration sort of campaign. So that's some of the sort of more difficult news, but there's a lot of good news, um, especially in Vermont for riparian forests. Um, so here's a really long list of that good news. Um, one is that mapping and restor restoring riparian forests is a specific part of the EPA approved plan for Lake Champlain to meet its water quality goals. Um, there's also a relatively new state law that was enacted in 2019 called Act 76, which is the um, Clean Water Service Delivery Act. And that will in part be providing funds for water quality projects, including riparian forest restoration. Um, in addition to that, there's a program currently under development called Streamwise, 
that is going to incentivize and award residential landowners who restore and maintain riparian forests um, on their property. There are lots of statewide programs to help landowners restore riparian forests, especially in the agricultural sector. And a lot of these programs will provide um, a large portion of the costs, the materials, the labor, um, and in some cases also provide financial incentives for landowners to restore these areas on their property. And they're run by folks who are thinking a lot about the various benefits that I talked about earlier. So people who are thinking about those water quality benefits, those wildlife benefits, and how to best design buffers to try and achieve as many of those benefits as possible. And then this is where I could talk a lot about the native tree situation. So there's currently an effort underway that I am working on to address the native tree stock shortage in, um, in the state. And that involves talking to people who are growing trees, talking to the folks who are buying trees for restoration projects, talking to potential funders, and really figuring out what is the shortfall, what are the challenges, and how can we sort of change the system a little bit so that we're addressing some of those so that people who are doing restoration projects have better and more reliable access to native trees for their projects and, and so that the growers also have the resources and support that they need to be able to run viable um, businesses or viable organizations um, that are growing native trees. And then there's... Um, just a lot of research and sort of in the field testing happening about how to control deer brows, how to manage reed canary grass um, when restoring riparian areas and how to really get the most out of the money that we're putting in to restore these areas and make sure that the trees that we plant are really able to grow and thrive and help us achieve those benefits that we're uh, looking for on the landscape. Um, so to conclude, I want to leave you with some images of riparian forest restoration projects that have happened in Vermont in the past few years. Um, so here's a project in Franklin County, um, and this is over a 12 year time period. So you can really see how much of a forest can develop in just a little over a decade. So I think that this is just really um, encouraging and inspiring to see these little tiny trees in just 10 years are really able to grow into this sort of young forest. And um, I've worked, I've gone out and looked at some of these sites with folks who are planting them. And something that I think is really interesting is that they're really figuring out because we've, there's been a lot of effort on this in the past couple of uh, decades, maybe past 20 years or so to figure out how to make these projects really successful. And something that I think is really interesting is that um, people are figuring out even um, the finer details of things like that you shouldn't necessarily plant the trees you want to see, the species of trees you want to see in a mature riparian forest, and has said, plant the trees that are just going to, you know, sort of thrive on that site right away and develop some shade, and then those trees that you want to see in a mature forest are actually able to develop in the shade of those um, trees that you planted. So there's all kinds of things that people are figuring out because we have so many of these projects happening across the state um, to make these projects as successful as possible. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple more. So there's another project in Franklin County. You can see this is over a five-year time period. So the forest is not quite as developed, but these trees are establishing and taking hold. And you can't actually even see the waterway anymore. So there's definitely a lot of vegetation coming in here, a lot of forest, and that's, that's really exciting here too. And then here's a, one last project in Orleans County. Um, again, just a five-year time period. Um, so you're starting to see some different forms of vegetation coming in, some shrubs. Um, there are young trees that are a little harder to see in this particular picture that will hopefully grow into those larger trees that we saw in that first, um, that first transformation. So I think there's a lot of hope. And as a state, we're really headed in a good direction. Um, there's also, if anybody on this call is interested in getting involved, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved with this work. There's always organizations that need help planting trees and other opportunities that well, as well. So if you're interested in that, you could reach out to your local, local conservation district or to me and I can help direct you um, if this is something that you wanna help work on. And that is what I've got. I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, there's just uh, so many thoughts that immediately enter my brain. And I think you hit the nail on the head, like the hopeful aspect. And I guess relating to a personal note, like I went for a dog walk. I live in the Richmond area and I went for a dog walk along the Winooski yesterday. And I know that there's a restoration project that's happening. And I guess I've been here for the you know two or three year time period, but I, I hadn't been to that area in, in quite a few months. 
and I went back and it just, the trees were towering, the leaves were out and it just truly like this path that I had for quite a few years walked pretty frequently. I just hadn't been to in a while. And you could see this riparian habitat right along the Renewski doing what it was supposed to be. And then you look off to your right and there's a whole bunch of erosion happening on the bank, but now the, the trail has gone through the tree system. So anyways, lots of, lots of good things sparked from your, your talk. So um, for participants, if you can throw any questions into the, um, the question and answer section, that'd be great. If the chat box is best for you, then you can do that too. But Allison, what we try and do with each of our um, speakers is at least start off with a question of how did you get into the field that you're in currently? You know, I don't need a, a full X amount of years type of thing because a lot of times they're they're very windy paths. Um, but just kind of curious of what you want to touch on. But how did you land the position that you have today? Um. Yeah, in my case, that might be an even more complicated answer. You are talking about specifically working the the half of me that works on riparian forests and not the half of me that's a PhD student in a different topic. You get to, you get to answer the question however you would like. So, okay, yeah, I think there's, it's quite, I have a very meandering path. My undergraduate degree was in art history and then I did a master's degree that was in like remote sensing and forest science because I knew I wanted to switch into doing something environment related. Um, and then as, a, and then wanted to do something that after doing that felt very like removed, like literally bird's eye view removed. That's what I was doing. Um, wanted to do something that felt more like connected with what was going on on the ground and with people. And so my PhD is in more of the social science side of things and how people interact with the landscape and what the meanings are embedded in that. And so that little slide that I had on like cultural heritage is, is like a lot of what my PhD is sort of in more of that kind of topic area. Um, but I'm really like, interested in, um, yeah, like how, I, I think after doing that for a while and also doing research, I also wanted to be working on something that had this, had a very tangible impact and felt, I've been in Vermont now for seven years and felt, feel pretty connected to Vermont and wanted to do something that had a really clear, tangible impact here in the state. And I know that water quality is just such a huge issue. And um, this particular position that I have is, is sort of multifaceted in that I'm like working with people who are working on these projects on the ground. I'm working on outreach. I'm working on figuring out how to share information between different groups of people and how to strategize. And so it brings together lots of different skills and my background in lots of different areas to address this particular issue in Vermont. And so I actually don't have any scientific background in riparian forest or water quality at all. Uh, surprise. <laughs> But I, I felt like this was a good way to sort of bring everything that I care about together and employ the skills that I have to, to work in this particular topic in this particular position. Yeah, no, I, again, the meandering path is common, not only for the pre presenters that we've met, but usually people that you meet is sometimes it falls in their lap. Sometimes they've been working towards that goal their, their entire lives. So it's fun to see where people are at. So um, we do have one question that just popped up in the question and answer, and it says, um, where can a landowner find information on Streamwise and other riparian buffer establishment programs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, thanks, Steve. So on Streamwise, I, Streamwise is in the process of being developed and I don't believe it has actually been released to the public at this point. So I was on a, like a community advisory committee kind of thing. Um, and the last meeting that we had, which I think was the final meeting for the advisory committee was just about a month ago. So they're working on sort of figuring out the final details of that, but definitely keep an eye out for it being rolled out and hopefully will be widely advertised so that um, that's something that people hear about. So it's not happening quite yet, but very, very soon. Um, and for other riparian buffer establishment programs, so this is something that I'm working on in my program is just getting information a little bit more centralized. There's lots of great information on the various websites of the people who run various programs, um, but it, it's hard to sort of figure out where to start. And so I've been working on that. What I would, what I have developed might be useful for a landowner. So on the Watershed Forestry Partnership website, which is on the Lake Champlain Sea Grant website, there is in the side menu, there is a link. Um, I think it says installing a riparian buffer or something like that. And if you click on that and go to the bottom, there is sort of a quick glance guide at the different programs, funding opportunities for landowners to get riparian forest buffer installed on their land and sort of what the, at a quick glance, like does the land need to be private or um, can you get funding for it? Um, is, are there financial incentives? So it, it goes through all of that. 
um, so that you can kind of identify and then says where to, who to talk to for more information once you've picked a program that sounds like it might be right for you. So I just made that resource. Maybe it will be helpful to somebody. <laughs> Well, uh, I obviously work with the, the right team members because I was waiting for you to finish your thoughts to be like, hey, Nate, behind the scenes, could you please uh, find the link? And he's on it and it's already in the chat box without me saying anything. So look at that. Um, if you want to see the resources that Allison was just mentioning, take a look at the link in the chat box. Um, all right. So another question came in um, from Bill in the chat and he says, is it accurate to say there's no minimum or maximum width of a riparian forest that it's entirely a function of land contour and or topography? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure I'm understanding the question correctly. So yeah, the, a riparian forest, I'll answer the best I can. A riparian forest can be sort of any width. I, I would say it has to be at least, I don't know, maybe at least 20 feet. At some point, it's just a row of trees. Um, so it has to be a deep enough width that you could legitimately call it a forest. Um, and then beyond that, it could be any width past that. And it is harder to sort of measure that width when you're talking about really steep slopes or um, really sort of uneven, an uneven landscape, it can be difficult to say. And then also, um, and maybe this is what you're getting at, Bella, is the fact that if, um, that the function, the way that buffer functions will be affected by the contours of the landscape. So if you have a really incised stream, for example, um, putting trees right up next to the stream is not necessarily going to help very much because they may not be able to stabilize that stream bank enough the stream that um, to really stay in place, they might just kind of get as little seedlings get sucked into the water and not really be able to serve much of a function. So you do have to think about, and then, you know, the topography of the land also affects how runoff flows and that can affect how if you have it all sort of channeling into one area, the forest isn't going to be able to take up much of that water. So um, there's a lot of different, those benefits are heavily affected by what the specifics of that site are. And also, yes, it could be any width and it's hard to measure that width based on the topography. So the answer to your question is yes. Yep, yeah, he gave you the, th the thumbs up, so. Great. <laughs> all right, we just had one pop up in the chat um, and it's from uh, Cassie and she says, thanks for an excellent presentation. Can you speak a little bit more about the main causes for the native plant shortage this year? Has it been an issue in the past? And then, you know, what types of solutions are you looking at and exploring into? Yeah, so I've only been in this position for a year. So I've only heard about this problem for a year. My understanding is that it's been a growing issue over time. Um, and this past year that I've been in this position, it was sort of an anomaly because um, of COVID. So there were projects that didn't happen. A lot of things were sort of shaken up by that, um, largely because of the volunteer side of things. Um, but I think, yes, it has been a problem in the past and it is um, getting worse over time. Um, there are a lot of causes, and this is one of the things that we're trying to sort of suss out from um, the surveys that are currently underway. So I'll have more concrete answers for you probably in about a month or two. But I think one of the major causes is that growing native trees for restoration projects doesn't tend to be particularly profitable. Um, and so those nurseries often need to have a fair amount of support or running on very thin profit margins. And that can be a challenge for just the long-term viability of those nurseries. Um, and so that's one thing. Another thing is that uh, is there's sort of a mismatch between when the people who are do the organizations that are doing restoration projects know that they're going to have funding and be able to do a project and when the nursery would need to know that they're going to need trees. And so sometimes the nursery needs to know that they're going to need trees sort of because, especially if they want older trees long before the organizations know that they're going to have the funding to do a project. And that would be fine if the funding was relatively stable over time. You could just sort of predict like, okay, we don't know for sure, but we're probably gonna have this funding. We can order these trees. The nursery can expect we're gonna have about these many order, this many orders, but that hasn't been the case. And COVID just made that worse. Um, so with variability of funding, nobody can really predict far enough in advance, which makes sort of making sure that there's enough stock available if there's a boom year for restoration projects, really, really challenging. Um, and so, I don't have an answer to what kinds of solutions we're exploring, mainly because I don't want to promise too much that I can't deliver on. Um, 
but there are, what I can say is that in other states, there are um, like state nurseries, and that is something that could be an interesting option to explore. Um, there are folks across Vermont who are interested in starting nurseries. And so one of the things we're looking into in this um, project, talking to growers and people who buy plants, we're also talking to people who are interested in starting nurseries to figure out what, what have their barriers been um, to see if we can get some of those addressed. So maybe getting some new nurseries started would be one thing, maybe increasing the capacity of some of the existing nurseries. So there'll be some stakeholder conversations to talk about that and um, hopefully also involving funders and maybe we can get, at least make a dent in this particular issue before it gets a lot worse. Yeah, I think that touched, touched upon it and, and those are, you know, it's definitely a problem, but you know, maybe that there's some solutions. So thanks for touching on that one. So um, we are nearing the end. I think we probably have time for one more question if a question does come in, but I'm gonna at least right now launch our um, feedback poll. Please stick with us to do this. It, it should take no more than one minute or so. Um, and maybe while we're doing that, Allison, you can stop sharing your screen and I'll have Nate pop up um, our Lake Champlain Sea Grant last couple of slides and see if, a, if um, any more questions come in in the meantime. Awesome, so please fill out that poll if you have the ability. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, this is the last of our Zuma Scientist series for the spring. We kind of go along with the academic school year and with the nicer weather uh, and some CDC regulations changing. I'm sure people are going to try and get away from their computer as much as possible. Um, but we do have now, gosh, over a year's worth of Zuma Scientist information um, on our YouTube page. So if you're feeling the need to do extra um, research or trying to learn some more information, feel free to check out our YouTube page. Um, or look at our Lake Champlain Sea Grant page. So Nate should be able to, in the chat box, put links to both of those things. Um, but at the current moment, I don't quite see any other questions um, coming in. So I'm gonna keep the feedback poll up for just a little bit longer. Um, so as people fill that out, but thank you again for, for joining us, Allison, a virtual round of applause for teaching us a little bit more about riparian buffers and, and forests and, and what role that they play here in Vermont. It sounds like they're doing pretty well, but we've got a lot more work to do. And I know from being a part of emails or local communities, there's continuous emails being sent out about people seeking help or wanting to help out in these regard, this regard. So take a look at that website that um, Allison mentioned that she created to hopefully point some people um, in the right direction or reach out to Allison directly. Um, so with that, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday afternoon um, and have a good one. Thanks so much, Caroline. Yeah, no problem, Bye, Allison.